We have been looking together on Wednesday evenings at the matter of abiding in Christ and what the matter of abiding in Christ produces in our lives as God's children. I've mentioned a couple of times uh, over the last couple of weeks, God had much more planned for you when he saved you than just to take you to heaven when you die. God had much more planned than just keeping you out of hell. And uh, a lot of Christians miss that in, in their Christian lives. We've been talking for the last couple of weeks on the matter of being changed into the image of Jesus Christ. Tonight, for a little while, I want to talk about this question. How can I be changed? Harry Ironside was preaching on one occasion before an assembly when he noticed close to the front of the building a man writing something on a card. When Dr. Ironside was finished lecturing, the man came to the platform where he was and handed him the card. The man was an agnostic lecturer and he was challenging Ironside to a debate on the subject of agnosticism versus Christianity. Agnosticism, if you're having trouble with that word and what it means, is the belief that the existence of God is either unknown or unknowable or denial that God even exists. Dr. Ironside looked at the card and then held it in front of him and, and stepped back to the middle of the podium and read the card aloud to the audience, the challenge. And he turned to the man and said, I accept your challenge under these circumstances. First of all, you must promise to bring with you to the platform one man who has been an outcast and a slave to sinful habits, but who heard you or some other infidel lecture on agnosticism and was helped to the point that he cast away his sins, became a new man, and is today a respected member of society, and all of that because of your unbelief. And then he said, secondly, you must agree to bring with you one woman who was once lost to all purity and goodness, but who can now testify that agnosticism came to her rescue while she was deep in sin and implanted in her poor heart a hatred of impurity and a love of holiness, causing her to become a chaste and upright woman, all through a disbelief in the Bible. And then Ironside continued, Now, sir, if you will agree to those two premises, I promise to be here with 100 such men and women, once just lost souls who have heard the gospel of the grace of God and who found new life and joy in Jesus Christ our Savior. Will you accept my terms? And with those words, the agnostic dropped his head and turned and walked off the platform and walked away in silence. The Christian life is primarily about a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ that produces a change from wickedness to holiness. That's what the Christian life is all about. We live in a time of ag agnostic reasoning. And so much attention is being focused today on, on self-helps. Everybody's got a self-help program that they want to sell you today. But there's got to come a time in a person's life when they realize, first of all, that God is the reason that they're here. And then secondly, that He is the one the only one who can transform them into the image of his son to change their life and make them a new creature. The primary purpose for my life and your life is not to learn more about ourselves or uh, learn more about other people. 
You're here to know God. God, God. God's desire in saving you, bringing you into the family of God, is that you know God and, and become like His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The only time that a man functions well in this world is when he's in good fellowship with his Creator. The rest of the time of his life is going to be wasted motion. All, all of life, as far as a Christian is concerned, is to be in, involved in learning more about him. As you learn more about him, your life begins to change. And, and you will experience a meaningful spiritual change. We call that sanctification. But it's a work of God in our hearts. You say, preacher, you're, you, you're talking about self-salvation. Oh, I beg to differ with you. I, there's only one way to be born again, and that's a supernatural process that begins the moment you exercise faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot be saved apart from that, and that is a work, a, a mighty work of God that happens the instant you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But in order for your life to be changed, there are some things that are going to have to happen, some things that you're going to have to follow in your life. Everybody is talking about deeper life experiences today. And you've got all these self-help books and books that are out there. Get in touch with your inner self. One lady said, I finally got in touch with my inner self and she's just as confused as I am. <laughs> I can tell you tonight, getting, getting to know ourselves and, and others is not going to produce a changed life. The key to a changed life is getting to know our God in a personal way. In Acts 17, 28, Paul said, For in Him we live and move and have our being. In essence, what he's saying in that verse is, my whole life is in Christ. Everything in my life is in Christ Jesus. When we experience real fellowship with God, all the other relationships in life are going to be changed. I want to talk for a little while this evening about this matter of a changed life and how it can come about in our personal lives. How, how can I be changed? I, I fear, as I was studying this week, I, I'm afraid that, that there are a lot of Christians that have a picture of God as being like a fairy godmother that zaps you with a magic wand when you get saved. Just change your life completely. That's not so. That, that just is not so. Uh, it'll not come about because God sends a good angel down and touches you and changes you. I heard somebody this week say, uh, say something, and it wasn't here at church, it was somewhere else. Somebody else said, they must have evil angels in their life. Well, there are. We call them demons. We don't call them evil angels. They're, they're demons in this world, and I have no doubt that a lot of people have demons on their trail. But I can tell you tonight, if it takes place in your life, it's not going to take place as some of the beloved brethren believe in a second blessing. Not going to come about because you come down here in the altar and wail and moan and beat the floor and cry out to God and say, oh God, would, would, would you give me more of the Holy Spirit? You got all the Holy Spirit you will ever get when you got saved. When you got saved, he came to live and abide with you a person. He didn't just come as part of a person. He came as a whole to live in you. And, and, and he's there residing in you. The, the fact is, what he wants you to do is give more of yourself to him. The only way we're ever going to be changed, first of all, is because we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That's where it all begins. But that... That's got to be followed up with some personal steps in our lives. Look with me to Philippians 2. I, I want to begin there just a couple of verses in Philippians 2, chapter uh, verses 12 and 13. Uh, these are verses that folks read and, and misunderstand so often. Uh, 
Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, when you're reading those two verses, tie work in verse 12 to worketh in, in, in verse 13 because they go together. Uh, he, he's not saying it's left up to you to work out your salvation. I, I want to tell you, God's already gotten the matter of salvation worked out and there's but one way to be saved and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about God working in our lives. How can I be changed? How, how as a Christian, can I be changed? How, how can my life become what the Lord desires for it to be? How, how can I be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ? Let me give you three things tonight. First of all, we've got a desire to be changed. There's got to be a desire in your heart to be changed. You, you've got to realize that spiritual change does not come naturally to us. It, it is not a, a part of, of your fleshly nature to want to be changed. A, age and maturity. I, I, I have met some folks who have been saved for 40, 50 years and they thought, their being saved 40 or 50 years uh, made them spiritual. Y your age as a Christian does not make you spiritual. I, some of the most carnal people I've ever met were older people who never studied their Bible, never prayed, had no devotional time, and yet they had, a, they had an image in their mind because of their age that somehow they were spiritual. Age and maturity cannot produce change in our lives then where does that desire for change come? Well, first of all, when God the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our heart, He creates places, a will in us to know Him, to, to know God, to know the Lord. Uh, verse 13 of Philippians 2 said, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. In Romans 7 and verse 18, Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Now what Paul is saying there in Romans 7, and I know there's some folks that say, well, Paul wasn't saved in Romans chapter 7. He's not saved. Did you get that glorious 8th chapter? Well, that's as foolish as it can be. <laughs> well, Paul is just talking about the, the struggle, the battle that goes on in the Christian life in, in Romans chapter 7. And what he's saying there is that even though as a Christian he may desire to do right, his flesh hinders him from performing that which is good. The, the flesh is always there. Uh, Flip Wilson used to have that, that statement, you know, that black comedian, the devil made me do it. Well, the, the devil may tempt you with it, but your flesh is going to have to going to have to give in to that before it ever happens. And and my battle and your battle primarily and first of all is with our own wicked flesh. Your flesh will never be anything but wicked in this world. The changing of a life is the work of God from the inside out. God has to begin on the inside and work His way out. Now we. Uh, we independent Baptists have had some struggles with that through the years. We want to get them cleaned up on the outside and never pay any attention to the inside. What I'm, what I'm preaching to you tonight in some circles, they may, maybe not today, but a few years ago would have been called deeper life stuff and, and, and I, would have been, I would have been looked down upon almost as a heretic because of what I'm preaching to you tonight. God must begin on the inside. You, 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 can, you can take a a hybrid pig and, and wash him and give him a buttermilk bath and, 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 and put softener on his old coarse hair and, 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 and kink his tail and make him look all prim and proper. But if you turn that pig loose, if there's a, hog, if there's a mud hole anywhere, he's going to go get in it. And, and that's a fact with the flesh. God has to begin on the inside. You can clean a man up on the outside, but you haven't changed him until God has done a work on the inside. It begins with God and continues as we yield to his leadership. God does give us the will to know him. 
And yet we've got to follow that will with a personal response. We have got to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. Listen to Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. When we were saved, God called us. God drew us. Nobody's ever been saved that God didn't draw to him. How the Spirit of God draws a man to, 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 to the Lord. Uh, when, when we were saved, God drew us unto himself and, and he gave us a desire to know him. He draws us to himself, but, but then he leaves us the choice of whether or not we respond to that. How many times have you, you said, I don't know why in the world so-and-so doesn't get saved. I, I've seen them struggle with conviction. Well, I'll tell you why they had not got saved. Because they haven't made a personal choice to get saved. They, they've got to make that choice on their own. There's an old proverb that says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And that's true. But if you'll get him thirsty enough and you take him to water, I can promise you he'll drink what's provided for him. Our problem often as Christians, when we have a, uh, find it hard to enjoy spiritual things, is because we're already full of something else. Hello? You, 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 can't, you can't get the kids up in the morning and start feeding them junk from the time they get out of bed until breakfast is ready, and then sit them down at the table and say, now eat your breakfast because they're already full of something else. It's, it's very hard as a Christian to get full of God when we have filled ourselves with everything else in the world that, that this world can offer. We've got to empty our hearts of fleshly desires and we've got to hunger to know Him. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. If we hunger after Him, He'll satisfy our needs every time. Real spiritual change in our lives, effective worship in our lives begins with a hunger and a desire for God and His Word. Not only does God create a will in us to know Him, but the Holy Spirit will lead us to know Him. Philippians 2.13 says, He will do of His good pleasure. God gives us the desire to know Him and then he accomplishes His will through our lives as we yield to His leadership. If we're not surrendering, we're, we're not placing ourselves in His leadership, then there's going to be no maturity in our lives. Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17, Paul illustrates this new nature of the believer. He said, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth. That word lusteth means covets. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The Holy Spirit gives us the desire to know God, gives us the desire to attend church, places in our heart a desire to witness to our lost friends. But then the question hangs over us, will I follow God or will I let my flesh control me? Will I yield to the Holy Spirit's working in my life or am I going to give in to my fleshly desires? In Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to verse 16, again Paul tells us how we can follow God's will. He says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. God's Holy Spirit gives us the will to do right and to become like Christ. It is the desire of the Holy Spirit to bring every one of God's children to a place of spiritual maturity. The struggle that's there is with our old flesh. Because that old flesh is always trying to bring us back to our old friends, bring us back to the wrong music, bring us back to those addictive habits that, that are there in the old life. God says, I have a will for your life. And my desire is that you would be conformed to the image of my son. 
I found, and, and, and I think you'll probably agree with me, that very often you can recognize a Christian by their life or by their lifestyle. They don't have to stand up on a bully pulpit and say, I want everybody here to know I'm a Christian. All you've got to do is spend just a little while around them and you, you quickly say, hey, there's something different about their lives. Why? They're following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. God didn't save us so that we'd go back to our old sinful habits. He saves us so that we can follow the Spirit's leading in our lives every day. If you've never felt, listen, listen to what I'm saying carefully. If you've never felt a desire to grow in godliness, then you probably ought to get your Bible and sit down somewhere and examine whether or not you've truly been born again. Because if you've been saved, if, you, if you're a part of the family of God, then you're going to have a desire to live a godly life. Those who are truly His children are going to have a hunger and a desire to know Him more deeply in their lives. We read that verse in Matthew 5, 6 a moment ago. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you really desire to know the Lord, you're going to be filled. It's going to happen. If the desire is there, it's going to take place. God does not create a desire that He does not intend to satisfy in our lives. I've said it so many times in this pulpit and in other pulpits, God created a hole in the heart of man that only Jesus can satisfy. Somebody said, I'm not satisfied with life. Then, then the first thing I want to ask that person is, how is your relationship with Jesus? He's the only one that can bring true satisfaction to a person's life. You start trying to, to, to fill that God-given desire in any other way, and all it's going to do is lead to disaster. Go to John chapter 4 and read the story of the Samaritan woman. It's a great example of the very thing that we're talking about tonight. She'd been married five times and was living with a sixth man in an adulterous relationship. Jesus talked to her about water that would fill her empty life forever. Not water from the well, but, but living water from above that would, would fill her empty life forever. And then he told her that she'd been trying to find satisfaction in other ways, but that she'd really never known God or the way of salvation. What a beautiful story that is, because that day the Samaritan woman believed in Jesus Christ. She was saved. And she went away spiritually changed. How do you know that? Because she went back to the village and told everybody there that she was saved. Her life had been changed. Why? Because she had a desire. God had created a desire. Jesus opened wide the window where she could see uh, how that need could be met. And she trusted him. God has placed in every person the desire to know him more. And when we truly seek to know Him and serve Him, then I promise you that desire is going to be filled. Only when we follow after Him will we be able to become like Christ and experience His joy. So how can I be changed? Well, first of all, you've got a desire to be changed. Secondly, you've got to seek to be changed. Not only must it be a desire in your heart, but you've got to seek that. How do you seek that? Psalms 105, verse 4, Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face evermore. Deuteronomy 4, verse 29, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find Him. If thou shalt seek Him with all thy heart and with all his, thy soul. There are two requirements involved in seeking to be changed. First of all, there's got to be determination. There, there must be determination. Spiritual, there, listen, there's only one way that spiritual growth will come and that's through diligent study and determination in your life. Study the Word of God. Spend time in prayer. Seek to know the Father. There's got to be determination there. We live in an hour and a time when so many Christians have been sold a false bill of goods that the Christian life is a party. It's, it's to be filled with fun and games. And they, they go to church looking for fun and games. 
I, I don't mean to be ugly when I come to this, and, 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 and there, there are going to be folks who would disagree with me on this and would get fuzzy-haired about it, but I'm going to tell you part of our problem is the fact that we have trained our children along the way with our children's church programs that church ought to be fun and games and they get to be teenagers and come in here and sit down and listen to a man of God preach and they're not going to do that. They sit there like a, like a, like a frog that, that somebody's uh, lit a match to. They're so uncomfortable. Why? Because they want fun and games. Can I tell you the Christian life is not, listen, we'll talk about joy in a minute and I don't mean to take away the joy of the Christian life. But, but, but Christianity is not a, a, a matter of fun and games. We, we reach a place when we have that philosophy that we're apathetic toward the Lord because we're passionate about seeking other things. I want to be entertained. I, I, want, to, I want to be made to laugh. I, I, I want to have fun. The problem is they're looking for the same things in Christianity that they find in the world. And I want to tell you, real Christianity is not going to offer you the same things that are found in the world. Do you have a passion to know God? Are you seeking Him? The Christian life is not an effortless life. It requires something. It requires that we seek God diligently. And if we seek Him diligently, He promises to reward our seeking. Every person was created as a passionate being. But you see, we can't be passionate about God and the world at the same time. <laughs> Only one thing can occupy your passions. You, you've, got, you've got to find a priority for those passions. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man, mammon. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul shares his testimony that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be changed, I, I, I've got to seek to be changed. And in order, in order for that to happen, there's got to be determination. Secondly, there's got to be devotion. One of the real problems in most of our Christian lives is a lack of discipline when it comes to spiritual things. We're just simply not disciplined. And the reason we're not disciplined is because we have no affection for the things of God. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm talking about us. I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the whole of us. That, that's where we are. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Look, look, read that. Man, man that, that, that is as strong as it can get. That, that's total devotion. That's total commitment. Let's just be honest with ourselves. The reason we're careless concerning our reading and studying the Word of God is not because we're too busy. We, we'll say that. Well, I'm just too busy to read the Bible today. Too many other things going on. But in reality, the truth is we didn't go there simply because we don't love the God of the Word like we ought to. It is a fact we live in a busy day. We've created it. God didn't create that. We've created it. We've created it with all of our time-saving devices. Have you noticed that? Man, I remember when we didn't, we didn't have any of the things we got today. And we had a lot more time. I, I can remember sitting on the, on the front porch in a rocking chair in the evenings for two hours with Grandpa and listening to him uh, spin yarns about growing up. We don't have time for that anymore. We gotta be on we gotta be on the computer doing something. We gotta be on Facebook doing something. We gotta watch our, our program on television. We've created our busy lives. And as a result of that, we've crowded God out of our lives, out of our schedule. What we need to do is re renew our desire to seek God with determination, with devotion, and give Him first priority in our lives every day. Psalms 34 and verse 10 says, They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. God is saying to us tonight, I'm still here. If you'll seek me, I'll give you what you need. Notice the emphasis there, seeking the Lord. It's all about seeking a person. It's not, it's not about seeking any of these other things. 
It's all about seeking a person. That person is Jesus Christ. I love the old hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. And I, I was thinking about it while I was studying for the message this week. As I thought about this desire to be changed. Verse 2 in that old hymn reads like this. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if every one of us just determined in our hearts tomorrow that we were going to take time to be holy? We're going to take time to spend in God's word. And we're going to admit our need of him and knowing him. What a difference it would make in our world. What a difference it would make in our family. What a difference it would make in our circle of friends. If we're to be changed. We've got a desire to be changed. We've got to seek to be changed. And then lastly, then we've got to abide in that change. First of all, God gives me the desire to know him and to be led by his spirit. That desire causes me to seek the Lord. He says, if you seek me, you'll find me. When I have reached this place, two very needful and vital things are produced in my Christian experience. Th things that are uh, of, of absolute necessity in my life for change to be created and, and change to be maintained in my life. Number one is fellowship. The carnal Christian spends... Maybe a few minutes on Saturday, if they're in a Sunday school class looking at a Sunday school lesson. Maybe an hour with the Lord on Sunday. And then they go back to a wicked world on Monday through Friday. They go to church and they get a little, little bitty dose of God. I mean, that's it. They just, they just get a, a light injection of God. And then they live like the world the rest of the week. What they've done... They, they've compartmentalized their Christian life. Uh, one, one of the most hideous things you can do is compartmentalize your Christian life. Don't, don't cut your life up into, well, well, uh, this is how, uh, I'm going to give God this part of my life and this is my family and my children and my grandchildren and my work. No, no, friend, listen. It's all about God. And God is everywhere in our lives. Our relationship with God cannot be what it ought to be or what he wants it to be like that. God, God's got to be at the center of everything we do in life. If not, then we've missed him. The gift of fellowship with Christ is not merely for a Sunday morning. It's available every day. You ought to be able to have as much fellowship. You ought, you ought to have had as much fellowship with God Monday as you did last Sunday. You ought to be able to have as much fellowship with God on Friday as you're going to have this coming Sunday. Remember the verse that we read in, in John 15 and verse 4, Abide in me, Jesus said, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. We've got to maintain fellowship with him. God wants us to spend time in close fellowship with him on a daily basis. I have known couples who were married for 30 years, 40 years, even 50 years. And they lived together in the same house. And yet they separated and divorced. Why? Because just living together in the same house, just having the same interest does not mean that you're experiencing oneness. Does not mean that you're experiencing intimacy in your relationship. God says it's not enough to just attend church. It's not enough to have correct Bible beliefs. All those things are good. But His desire is that we enjoy continual intimacy with Him. He wants our fellowship with Him to be open and clear. And it's an area where so many Christians struggle in their Christian life because of a lack of satisfaction. The problem, they're not in continual fellowship with the Lord. As we abide in the Lord, He wants us to experience something else in our Christianity. Not only fellowship with Him, 
But as a result of that fellowship in Him, real joy, true joy, joy that is created by His presence. There is, there is such a joy in living for the Lord Jesus. There, there's such a wonderful joy in, in fulfilling His purpose for our lives. Listen to what John said in 1 John 1, 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. That one who's living for the devil does not have joy. They may find moments of, of temporary happiness, but they, they, there's never lasting joy. They're, they're always looking for another drink to just to soothe their conscience. They're always looking for another fix just to calm their tormented mind. But every day the child of God can walk in joy knowing that there's a God who loves them, knowing that they'll spend an eternity with Him. And the wonderful news is that, is that we can abide in that renewing relationship every moment of every day. It's not, God doesn't hide himself from us. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. I used to enjoy playing hide and seek as a boy with the boys in the neighborhood. We'd, about dusky dark, we'd play hide and seek. We wasn't sitting somewhere with a computer looking at, looking at uh, something we ought not be looking at or fiddling with our phone sending a text to somebody else. We, we, we enjoy, but, but God doesn't hide from us. God doesn't have a hiding seat contest with us. He doesn't hide himself for us. He invites us to abide in him constantly. His desire is that we include him in every decision, that we call on him for every need that we have, that we trust him for every provision, and that we follow him in every circumstance of our life. His desire is to walk with us all day long, every day, constantly transforming, renewing, and shaping us in the image of His Son. And yet, hear me, that's His desire. And yet He leaves the choice to us. God's already voted on that, and it's His desire to do that. But you and I have got to execute our vote in this thing and make the right choice. God will never force us to spend time with Him. What a sad thing it is to see Christian people get in a mess physically, wind up in a mess financially, wind up in trouble in their home, wind up with all kind of difficulty with their children, and they've left God out of their Christian experience. All the, oh, they may have had just enough, uh, uh, just a little taste of religion here and there, just enough of a, a, a dose of God every now and then to help them feel religious. And they've left God out of their lives and, and they've not spent time in His Word. And then crisis comes and the, and the walls come tumbling down and, and, and they grab God's Word. It, it, it's just like, it's just like a, a, a kid in school knowing a test is coming and waiting till the night before the test is to be given to try to cram for that test. God doesn't want us to operate like that. He wants us to spend time with Him every single day. And He's not going to force us to do that. But how wonderful that He, he invites us to do that. God's plan for every one of us is more than a fire escape from hell. It's living a transformed and spiritually renewed life right here on this earth. We can live with a little heaven in our life on our way to heaven. Amen? We can experience a little... Listen, I, listen. if, if you just wait till you get to heaven to enjoy all the joys of heaven, friend, you've missed it because you can enjoy heaven on the way to heaven. How? By allowing the Lord to renew every day in your life. And we need that. I need that. We, none of us, none of us have reached the apex of spiritual maturity. We all need that no matter where we are in our spiritual lives. We need renewal today and every day. We need God's strength to change us. Preacher, how can I be changed? Well, first of all, I've got to desire that change. Secondly, I've got to seek it. 
I've got to determine in my heart and devote myself to it. And then thirdly, I must abide in that change. It must be a part of my life. And, and as I abide in it, he produces fellowship with the Father. Oh, what blessed, 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 a blessed thing fellowship is with the Father. And then joy in our lives. Hey, let me ask you, and I'm done. Can you honestly say those things are a part of your life tonight? Right now, right now, a, a present part of your life? If you're truly born again, they ought to be. If you're not born again, then you need to be. And then you need to allow the Lord to work in your life and meet Him and allow Him by choice in your own mind and heart, allow Him to renew your heart and life day by day. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for helping me today. Lord, You bless my heart. I, Lord, I've been encouraged as I have studied. And I, I thank You for the truth that's here tonight. And I pray, Lord, as feebly as I've tried to present it and, and share it, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would have taken my stumbling remarks and cleared them up and, and made them presentable to hearts here tonight and that folks would leave here uh, as Christians desiring to be renewed every day, that we all together might become more and more like the Lord Jesus. Bless these moments of decision and invitation tonight. And, Help folks to respond to you as you've spoken in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please, quietly for just a minute? Miss Janet, please. You need to pray right there where you are, maybe tonight. Lord, please forgive me. I, I've missed some of this. I, I've not been attentive to this. Please help me, Lord. I, I, I want to be, I, Lord, help me to be determined. Oh, God, I want to walk with you, and I, I surely want to be all that you want me to be. Would you help me tonight in my Christian experience? Maybe you need to pray for someone tonight. I encourage you to do that. While we wait just a minute.